We're so excited to have this special collaboration with NASA Johnson Space Center, and we're honored to present this historic event. I'm also very excited to introduce the moderator for our program. She's also the first African-American woman to be the director of NASA Johnson Space Center, Vanessa White. I'm happy to be here with you all at Space Center Houston today. We're going to hear from former and current astronauts who will share with you their own journeys to space. Robert Kirby, Jeanette Epps, Bernard Harris, Leland Melvin, Stephanie Wilson, Victor Glover, I'm going to start with a question and I'm going to throw it out and would like for everyone to have an opportunity uh, to give a response. Describe to us a picture of who you thought you would be as a student or young child. What were you studying and what type of person did you think you could be? Hmm. We'll start with Stephanie. Well, I, uh, when I was in middle school, I was very fortunate that my uh, parents were very supportive and education was very important to them. And uh, I was given a school assignment in a career awareness class to interview somebody uh, that uh, worked in an interesting career field. And I was interested in astronomy at the time. And after talking to a local area uh, astronomy professor, I was fascinated by his work. Uh, I thought that that would be an excellent way to contribute uh, to being a, a STEM professional. When I was a really young kid, probably sixth grade, my mother gave me this age and appropriate non-OSHA certified chemistry set. <laughs> and I mixed these two dissimilar chemicals and created the most incredible explosion in my mother's living room. I burned a hole in her carpet. <laughs> and my mother was, she was small, but she had the power to knock me off the... <laughs> but um, it was that moment that I realized that I could be a chemist because I'd already done it. All I needed was a lab coat and goggles. So... <laughs> So chemistry was something I learned at an early age and uh, I love sports, but I never saw myself going into the NFL because it just, I don't know, for whatever reason, but I did see myself as a scientist. So STEM was always something that was very critical to me. It's funny, I think it all starts with chemistry because my mother was a chemistry teacher. Ah. <laughs> and as I got older, um, the chemistry set kept getting bigger and bigger. I didn't burn a hole in her carpet, thank God because I might not be here if that happened. But, uh, but, um, but that was always interesting to me. And, and, and I grew up uh, in Baltimore during a time when Apollo was big. So I just kept seeing these larger and larger rockets mm. being designed. And it, it just, design always interested me. And I always thought I was going to be a design engineer. That's what I was going to be. So as a kid, um, I didn't really know who I thought I would be when I grew up. I just kind of, you know, did my thing and, you know, did my work. And one day, you know, when I was about nine years old, my twin sister and I, we brought home our report cards. And back then you had a report card and you had a row of all your grades and you could see immediately, okay, you had all A's or B's or whatever. And, and you know, Janet and I, we were pretty obedient kids and we knew that if we brought home anything less than an A, our mother was not gonna be happy. And yeah, she, she knew how to throw a shoe or whatever to make sure you <laughs> stayed in line. But you know, one day we brought our report cards home and my older brother goes, wow, you guys can probably become aerospace engineers or even an astronaut. And my nine-year-old brain said, well, they'll never pick me to be an astronaut, but I can definitely become an aerospace engineer. And so at nine, I had set my sights on becoming an engineer, an aerospace engineer. I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> I guess the first version of who I saw, what I, you know, that I could become was my father. My father was a police officer in Pomona where I grew up. And so I just really was blown away by the way people responded to him, you know? And so I, I looked up to him, but other people clearly did. And so I wanted to be a police officer like my father. Um, I also looked up to Marcus Allen, 
Los Angeles Raiders <laughs> running back. And, uh, and I wanted to be like Marcus Allen. So sports were important. My father and his influence were important. And then I saw a shuttle launch on TV and thought I would love to control that thing and, and drive one of those. And, and so the, the interest in tinkering and machines and speed and power and sports and also just wanting to be a good person like my father, those things all wove together and in and, and one way or another led to me being here. So I was listening to the others talk about what inspired them and what inspired me was what inspired uh, a lot of American kids back in the 60s. I, I grew up watching the space program. I, I learned very early that I liked science and science fiction. So I always like to say that I was an original Star Trek fan. And so that got me exposed to space on television. But uh, in real life, I watched the program develop, you know, the Mercury program, Gemini program, oh, Apollo funny. program. And in 1969, when I turned 13 years old, I watched Neil and Buzz uh, Aldrin land on the moon, and I said, I want to follow in their footsteps. Airman from the planet Earth, first step foot upon the moon, July 1969, BT. And as I looked around to, uh, at NASA, to the point that we're talking about race, I didn't see anybody who looked like me. I didn't see any women. In fact, the uh, first people that they selected to be the creme de la creme, you know, the top astronauts were white guys, all white guys. And so I remember saying to myself, even though I don't see anybody who looks like me, I'm still not gonna let that deter me from deciding on what I wanted to do. Did race ever play a role in the idea of who you could be? Did race ever play a factor? I would say one major area where, where race played a factor was I, in high school, so as I'm kind of starting to develop this plan on how do I become those things, and, and uh, I knew college was in my path, but I, I didn't have any, uh, neither of my parents went to college, so you know we were having to figure this out together. And the Naval Academy came to my house and said, do you want to play football at Annapolis? And I was like, nope, no thank you. And West Point came, said the same thing, and I said, nope. And Annapolis actually came back and says, would you like to wrestle? And that was really my main sport. I love football. I wanted to be like Marcus Allen, but I was a better wrestler. And you want to come grapple at Annapolis? And I said, no, thank you. And so I don't know if any of you have seen uh, the movie Boys in the Hood, but the father in that movie is Furious Styles. And, and the conversation that he has with his son is something very similar to, to how I felt. It, it was that there wasn't a place for me in the military. And so I go to college, I go off to college, and one of my mentors, I'm in his office waiting for him to come in. He's one of the few black faculty members at my university. And he comes into the room, and as he steps in, he is in this full regalia, the black suit with the gold around the wrists and the hat. And, and I was like, wow, sir, when did you enlist? And he said, I'm actually an officer in the Navy Reserves. Boom. The, uh, the next version of what I could become. And that, to me, was, there's so many lessons I pulled from that but the power of exposure and seeing yourself in something. Hello everyone, Victor Glover here, checking in during my six month mission aboard the International Space Station. When we were growing up in the 60s, it was interesting to you know, see some of the greatest feats of humankind on the television, little black and white television, but turn the channel and see some of the greatest challenges that we had in the United States at, at the time. So you know, watching Martin Luther King at the same time we're going up to going to the moon, it was incredible. Talking to my mom and who was a teacher who said, you know, would always ask us, what do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to do when you grow up? And kind of pushing us. And I remember going to her and saying, mom, I know what I want to be. I want to be an astronaut. And she said, that's nice. <laughs> and started to turn around, but then again, she turned back, she said, but if that's what you want to do, you can be and do anything that you want. Good time. As a kid, I became interested in airplanes, and 
liked uh, making model airplanes and reading books on airplanes. And I was fascinated by airplanes. And so that proved to be uh, what I find later on to be my passion. You know, I don't know if I had a vision of who I wanted to be when I was younger, uh, but I will tell you this. I, I think I was born to be an engineer. And I think specifically, I was born to be an electrical engineer. I remember being in, I think it was seventh grade. We had this assignment before we could take off early to go to recess. So you had to write down where you saw yourself in, I don't know, 10, 15, 25 years. And I simply wrote down on my little assignment sheet that I want to be able to look up from where I was working and see the curvature of the earth from space. Uh, and I plunked that down the desk and headed off to recess. My mother was my main inspiration. That they discovered art uh, when I was uh, in preschool. And she had me in every art class that ever was. And she got me a library card when I was four. And we, and we had conversations, and she would talk about astronomy and orbital mechanics and space. I grew up in the segregated South, so I am a, a son of the South, if you will. Blacks and whites went to separate schools and had separate facilities and everything. But uh, in the mid-50s or so, there were lots of programs on television that talked about life in the military and actually promoted the military. So that's where I saw the Naval Academy. I, I fell in love with the uniforms more than anything else and the beauty of the what's called the yard. It's the, the campus of the U.S. Naval Academy. And it didn't hurt that all the pretty girls from all over the Northeast came there on the weekends looking for husbands. You sort of assume that the astronauts never had hard times. Yes, I've had hard times too. At some point in everybody's life, they're gonna have that moment where they're gonna have to step off the ledge. They're gonna have to just make that push out into the void. And it's always, always, always going to be an a, a extreme gut check. But I think the important thing is to keep your goal in mind. And my goal was to succeed and eventually become an astronaut and to be patient enough to, in order to hang in there. In other words, don't quit. Don't ever let anybody tell you that you can't do something and always have an alternative plan if uh, things in your life kind of go awry. You, you never learn a damn thing with your successes. And so, so the idea of failure is probably the best thing that can happen to people who, who want lasting success. Uh, because on the next time around, you think your way through a better way, a more creative way to get through uh, to, to, to your success. And then it forces you to be creative. Well, I feel very honored to be the first black astronaut to fly in space. And in that role, one of the things that I wanted to do is not only be a role model for uh, African-Americans on the ground, but also be a, a leader in helping pull other black astronauts into space with me. It, it is hugely important to see people who look like you um, and who can inspire you, especially in, in fields that you want. Um, because it shows you, I mean, right there, the people that are there that you can touch, that you can feel, that you can reach out to, that you can talk to, that, you know, if they can do it, then there's a chance for me to do it too. When I was first thinking about becoming an astronaut, I asked my father, can black people become astronauts? Remember, this is just a few years after the Civil Rights Act of 64 had been passed, and there was still a lot of segregation. It didn't go away overnight. And he looked at me, he says, not only can you be an astronaut, there have been people, black people, there was at least one black pilot who was selected to be an astronaut. But the fact that he had gone out there and had, had blazed that trail meant to me as a five-year-old boy that there was no limit. There was no, there was no, nobody's going to stand in my way. The only way I was not going to become an astronaut is if I decided not to become an astronaut. And I needed that role model out there to inspire me. I, you know, I have a connection to all the African-American astronauts because in some way either we were in the office together and so we share experiences from that or they came before me and I met them and um, it's just a small uh, sorority slash fraternity uh, and we try to support each other and you know we get together every once in a while and talk uh, and so it, it's a great group to be a part of and I appreciate each and every one of them.
and the heroes themselves. <laughs> I want to frame this as this is all about you guys because you are our future. And again, he said, ask us anything, but the transparency and the authenticity is, is so important that you guys go back because you're the leaders. What would the next big culture shift, what would you like to see? What would you want it to be? When I think about what Elon Musk is doing, Jeff Bezos, these billionaires are spending a lot of money on these new platforms that's going to enable us to have that life, to have that economy in space. But then when I go to you know, our communities, our black and brown communities, and see what the kids are doing and seeing, and seeing whether they're prepared for that future, that's when I'm going to go, oh, we got a lot of work to do. Because if we're not there, and we're going to be stuck on Earth, right? So they're going to leave us behind. So my vision is that we don't get left behind as a people. I gotta tell a quick story. So yesterday, <laughs> I was in National Car Rental yep. getting my car. Yep. <laughs> and this little lady was right here. I was like, hey, you know, she saw my NASA shirt on. She said, NASA, oh, is there this thing tomorrow at Space Center Houston? I'm like, yeah, are you coming? Oh, no, I didn't fill out the application. No, I didn't, I didn't do it. I said, and she was supposed to be off yesterday. Right. Mm -hmm. She was there. I was there, and she is here today because she was supposed to be here today to hear this chemistry major yeah. going to rule the world yeah. one day. Maybe be Elon <laughs> Elon Musk too. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know, right? Right. But this is where it starts. Like we're talking a lot about what we see for the future and like shaping a lot of the stuff for the future, and there's so many schools, so many. Um, elementary schools, they don't have a lot of funds and et cetera, but people like you come in and they talk and then my life has changed. Now I'm an astronaut. <laughs> you know, that's, that's crazy. For me, I've always wanted to be a scientist. I've always wanted to work like in NASA. I've always wanted to do, this has been my entire life. Like when I was two years old, I drew a permanent marker on the wall, all of my friends, and they were all astronauts, <laughs> et cetera. And I've always known what I wanted to do with myself. So it was beautiful that I felt like the universe came up with the confirmation, like, hey, well, you're a little bit nervous about starting classes to back up, but here goes Leland. And he comes in with all this positivity and like, yeah, you should do it. And I did. Honestly, coming from places where I came from, I didn't I never see anybody aspire to work for NASA, NASA to be an astronaut or to be in these fields. So seeing people, these heroes, excuse me, reaching these heights, it, it lets me know, hey, you know what? I can do this. It's possible. I often find myself, you know, like, um, tough times having a uh, lack of motivation. I often tell myself I can't do something. If, if something gets too difficult, or if, I, or if I just get frustrated, or if I fail too many times or something. It's like I often just come, like, see myself kind of like almost giving up. So it's all like, for y'all to be in such, you know, leadership and strong positions, it copies so much within y'all time. Like, how do y'all stay motivated? So one thing that I think about, um, which can kind of seem like a burden at times, but it can also be the power to keep going. Like, I love thinking about the civil rights era and like the fact that when you see them getting off those buses and going to the March on Washington for jobs and freedom, say the whole time, they had bags in their hands. They didn't make those sandwiches. There was a party making sandwiches and then there was a different group of people that took the sandwiches to the people. And then there was a different group of people directing them to get on the buses. They were organized, right? And that all that, that work was done so you could sit in this seat. And when you think about that, our legacy runs from the very beginning up to you right now. It's, deep, it's your job to keep it on. And sometimes that can seem like a burden, but it's also a privilege. We are, we are connected to all of you. Know, we come from greatness. What are the emotions uh, that, that come to your, to your mind when you think about Juneteenth and the role that you play today? Oh, wow. So Juneteenth is a way that we honor uh, the fact that uh, right here, not far from us, uh, after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, we had slaves that were still enslaved. And it was two years after that process that they were able to actually uh, attain the freedom. And so Juneteenth is uh, uh, now received a lot of attention, but it was something that uh, wasn't widely celebrated. And so one, I'm encouraged to know that it's become something that is gaining national and, and maybe even global attention. But it also is a reminder that, you know, we, we have come a long way, but we have a long way to go. The person who started uh, the Journal of Negro History 
and then started Negro History Week, which is what we now celebrate as Black History Month. When he started it, he wrote in the journal, he said, we, we need not celebrate uh, Negro history. We celebrate the Negro in history. What we need is history void of racial, gender, and religious bias, because it's our story, all of our stories. And so I'm just encouraged that we have a chance now to be a part of telling that story. So Victor, um, I'm gonna ask you, what strategic steps are needed to offer more persons of color in more active roles? There's a lot of things we could do and we don't have time. We could take all the time we have today to talk about just what we can do. But one thing that we must do is those of us who are already in this enterprise, we have to go and, you know, it's not just like encouraging you. You know, we, I love this saying, we say that we have space for you. Listen, we need you, we need you. When the baby boomer generation retires, the science and technology jobs that are going to go away, if you look at the university students in undergrad and graduate school right now, we don't have enough of you in science and tech to fill those jobs. So we need you. It is a national security imperative for you all to become the best you you can be so that we can keep doing what we do. So we have an audience with students, and I know that they want to hear about your space time. So what was your most challenging uh, time in space? Can you tell us that, Stephanie? Probably my most challenging time was uh, during the STS-120 mission. Uh, we were building the International Space Station. And so we were bringing uh, the Node 2 module uh, to the International Space Station. Solar array deploys starting on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. And it's a smaller module. It's a connecting module on the end of the US laboratory, but it allows our partner laboratories to uh, have a connection point on the space station, uh, our uh, partners from Europe and Japan. And um, during that mission, we had um, installed that module and it also required uh, reconfiguring the electrical system. So we had to move uh, one of the solar arrays from a central position to uh, the end of the truss on the space station. And in order to do that with the robotic arm, basically have to fold up the solar array, move it with the robotic arm and then uh, extend it, re-extend it. And during that extension, uh, we had a dynamic event. Houston Alpha on the big loop, um... We uh, detected some uh, what appears to be a wraparound or some damage, and we're zoomed in on it on camera 24 right now. So uh, similar to what you may have heard about Apollo 13, where when we're in space, we have limited resources, we have limited um, uh, materials, we have to fix whatever happens with what we have on board. Because of this, um, Relocation, it was hard for spacewalkers to reach, so we had to do something that we had not practiced before with the robotic arm and the boom sensor system that we used at the time for the orbiter. We hooked those two together, put the spacewalker at the end, and then sent him out to the work site with what we had fabricated on board, these cuff links to tear across, to uh, drape across the hole to give the uh, panel system additional rigidity so that we could ex uh, continue the extension. So I say all that to say um, we worked together with our mission control team to come up with a solution, but we had to use the resources that we had in hand, uh, do robotics and spacewalking operations that we had not performed before, and rely on each other and our skills. It's a good day's work right there. I'm gonna go back a little bit because it ties into the story she just told. And so I go into test pilot school and we as a, stu as a class have to go to a conference. And at this conference, the keynote speaker is Pam Melroy. Oh. And Pam Melroy, who is I believe the second female shuttle commander, mm -hmm. stands up and tells that story. She tells the story about we, the cufflinks, that's the, yeah. they use the cufflinks. And she tells that story and that's the day I decided, all right, I'm throwing an application in. So I also think it's neat how our stories do link together, like you just said, uh, and I think that that's beautiful, this legacy here that, that can, continues to, to grow and evolve. I found myself immediately thrown into a leadership situation uh, for which I was unbelievably well prepared, but I didn't know it. 
because my idea of what I was going to have to do as a leader, as the leader of NASA, the leader of human space flight, the leader of science, the leader of space stuff for the whole world. If you've ever heard of, there is something called the imposter syndrome. It's a feeling that people get, I get all the time, that uh, you don't belong where you are. Um, and it's really important for you to recognize that, you, that you're suffering from the imposter syndrome because it is a syndrome, it's not real. You, you do belong where you are, but, but you have had people put doubts in your mind for so long. And I had grown up in the segregated South where you know, I was taught to believe that, uh, that, that things like being the NASA administrator or like being the president of the United States were not things to which I should aspire. That's not what black people did. Where I thought I didn't belong, it turned out that not only did I belong, but, but I, I tended to, some people will say I excelled. I mean, if you're really passionate about doing something, you, what you do, you end up finding out who, do, who does it really, really well. Uh, you know, uh, and, and because I had difficulty, uh, because there were things, a lot of things I didn't know about art, but I had to think my way through it. A, a tragic story, the guy called me aside and asked me, uh, uh, don't bring any more of those things here. So now I had to be creative. Oh, really? So I went straight to the bank and I borrowed $60,000 and built a foundry. And I didn't know how to build a foundry. So I went to the people who make foundry equipment and then they, when I got to the molds, I didn't know how to make a mold. So I went to the people who sold mold material because I, I have to do it myself because the larger community won't do it for me. So I've done that th throughout my entire art career. You know, they close a door in my face and I go open it. I am inspired. I am very hopeful that in the future there will be more women of color in space to the point where we cannot n name the number, right? The, the number is irrelevant. As I said, my mother was a librarian, so I grew up loving books and poetry and stuff like that. And my favorite poet is, uh, is a woman by the name of Nikki Giovanni. She, she wrote a poem many years ago, and, and it's called Quilting the Black Eyed Pea, uh, We Are Going to Mars. And, and this was before we started talking about taking trips to Mars, because in it she tells, um, you know, why black people, why people like me are ideally suited to lead the path to Mars. Quilting the Black Eyed Pea, we're going to Mars. We're going to Mars for the same reason Marco Polo rocketed to China, for the same reason Columbus trimmed his sails on the dream of spices, for the very same reason Shackleton was enchanted with penguins, for the reason we fall in love. It's the only adventure. And that's the way the trip to Mars is gonna be. We're gonna be holed up in our spaceship and. The first few days, we're going to be able to look back at our planet Earth and we'll see this little blue dot. And, and after a couple of weeks, that little blue dot's going to almost disappear. And there'll come a time somewhere in that eight months journey when it doesn't make any difference which direction you look. You're not going to know where you're going and you're not going to know where you came from because it's all going to look just kind of woo. It's going to be black. And also now joining us is Dr. Bobby Satcher, Robert Satcher, and uh, he has logged over 259 hours in space and is currently a doctor in surgical oncology at MD Anderson. So thank you for joining us. Well, my story is, of course, I, I grew up in Hampton, Virginia, and um, there was Langley that was there and uh, was inspired, you know, to want to try to be an astronaut pretty early on from watching Apollo missions and, of course, didn't see anybody that looked like myself during that. Um, it wasn't until the shuttle era um, and, you know, some of my uh, uh, co-astronauts here that uh, sort of blazed that trail. When I was in college is when I sort of first um, uh, you know, thought that I could do it. 
had the chance um, to meet Ron McNair. He also, uh, you know, went to MIT for his graduate studies and he was there giving a talk. And, and so that was the first time that I sort of said to myself, I was an undergraduate at MIT, but first time I sort of said, yeah, you know, maybe that's something I could do. So yeah, that was a very inspirational moment. We did talk about, you know, the fact that representation matters. And uh, so two of our um, space uh, heroes that um, actually um, sacrifice on behalf of all of us, their spouses are here today, and I want to recognize them. I want to recognize Cheryl McNair, and I also want to introduce Sandy Anderson. of Mike Anderson. So thank you both for being here. And Jeanette, want to bring you into the conversation. All right, well, my um, journey is very similar to everyone's here, but there's always these different uh, nuances. You know, we were talking earlier about, you know, you, you're gonna have things to get through, and I think all of us had similar experiences, and you know, you grew up in segregated um, areas and things happen, but I always focus on how do you handle those things when they do occur, because they're gonna occur. You know, there's a verse in the Bible that always says that, you know, in this world, you're gonna have tribulation, but take heart, You've over I've overcome the world. And so that just tells me that troubles are gonna come. And so how do you handle those? And, you know, having a sense of self and knowing who you are and what you're capable of and not letting people feed negative energy into your life is hugely important. But also being a proactive person rather than being reactive has been things that I've stood on for my entire career. I'm like a black female and aerospace engineer. There was no one that looked like me in aerospace engineering, but that never even dawned on me until I left there. These are the kind of things that um, I always love to tell students, you know, there's gonna be times when you have to figure out who you are. And it's in those tough times that you actually really realize what you're capable of. I really appreciate that because a, a lot of times um, as a person, you get stuck in this place of fear to do something. Um, I don't know if I'm going to fit into this space. I don't know if I should be here. I don't know what I should be doing or how I should be doing it. And you don't do it. <laughs> you, you just sit, you just sit. And it's it's easy to do that when you don't have people around you, you're not meeting people who are doing things. I think you hit the nail on the head right there. It's all about supporting one another. You know, there's enough threats outside of the tent to, to fill a whole day. So we have to support each other all the time. If we do that, not a whole lot's gonna stop us. Like I often limit myself just because, um, Basically, like my surroundings, I just, I just thought like the world, like I thought this was my world. And like one thing I'm learning too is I like, you know, a lot of stuff may come up and you may be in a situation where you may not know where you are or, or you came and find yourself, but we can't give up. Like we just can't. I mean, I always knew I wanted to do more than just be there and watching cars go by and stop. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I didn't, I didn't allow that to, you know, define my imagination in terms of, I mean, I sit there staring up at the sky and imagining what it would be like to go there. So I don't think I've ever said that before, but I, you know, I really actually would do that. Okay, so I told my mom uh, that I was, uh, I was coming to do this. I'm going to show her that uh, my, my notebook, because like, that's actually my notebook that I still use for class right now. I'm going to use this as like my, my uh, motivation to really achieve my goal. Honestly, this really means the world to me. Like, this is like easily one of my most cheerful items right now. There's not always going to be somebody there to cheer you on. And as much as I would love to, I would love to be that person. You know, break out your cell phone. I'll, I'll, I'll make a ringtone for you right now. You can play it every day. <laughs> but, but that's not reality. And you're going to have to build something that works for you. So one, that's one of the important parts of learning and getting around groups of people like this that are diverse. You learn and you, you add another facet. You put another tool in your toolbox. I always go back to like how my mother, she's very religious for a Christian household, but she always says walk faith. Um, walk by faith and not by sight, baby. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's something that I feel like the black community, we have a hard time with because it's not only what we see, but it's what we're told from other people. So I feel like 
all of us can do it. I practice it, try to every day because it's just so hard when the world's like telling you, you can't, you can't, you can't, or that's impossible, or are you sure you can do that? But it's just like, I'm not walking by what I see, but what I know I can do by faith. So I, I want to ask uh, one of our um, astronauts to talk about his time uh, doing a spacewalk. So the record holder for a single spaceflight mission of spacewalks is Robert Kirby. Can you tell us about what it's like? Hello, Beamer. Oh my gosh, it's, it's an amazing experience. And Bernard can tell you too, uh, you know, so when I first came to the office, shortly after I came into the office, Bernard did his first. So Bernard blazed a trail and I tell people all the time, that's the best way to go. You have someone else that blazes a trail and you get to walk <laughs> down. <laughs> so so I, I'm very thankful for that. And then after him, Winston, and, and, and so that, that was a great part of it. But we always had this saying, you know, you, you train like you fly, you fly like you train. And then the first thing they tell you is, but when you go on a spacewalk, something's going to be different than you planned. And it is so true. My very first spacewalk, so I'm out there doing my thing, trying to follow the timeline. And all of a sudden, I... Um, I and reconfiguring some ammonia lines and one of the valves that is supposed to automatically close does not and starts spraying me with anhydrous ammonia. And sure enough, training takes over. And, you know, it's kind of funny because I talked to the flight surgeon later. He goes, yeah, he goes, during the emergency, actually, your heart rate went down. <laughs> and it's because, you know, the hard work's really done before you go on the spacewalk when you're getting ready for it. So when yep. things happen like that and your, you know, front of your suit has an inch or two of ammonia ice on it, and later on you realize that you cannot go back in the spacecraft with this, so you hope that someone has a plan to get it off. <laughs> <laughs> and they did. Uh, and, and um, you know, but, but, the, but the, the lesson learned there is that, you know, it's not actually the act of the event that is hard it's getting ready for the event. Yep. And that's something I learned from Bernard and other people who told me, look, you have to work hard now so that the actual space flight and the space walk is easy. I mean, physically, it was not a big deal. Mentally, I was exhausted afterwards. Right. But worth it. So uh, we're going to open it up uh, to our students. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> what is your work like when you're not in space or training for a mission? There's no average day. Some days I have a lot of meetings, uh, but you know, some days I get to go and scuba dive or full pressure dive at the, the, the giant pool that we have, six million gallons of water where we train for spacewalks. Or right on the other side of that facility, there's an airport and we go fly our T-38 high-performance aircraft. One of the biggest things that we have to do is function very well as a team. We go on expeditions where we, we want to get people to push, their, push everyone's limits to see how you act when you're in this heightened state of awareness. We work hard on leadership and teamwork, and so it involves really just spending time together and being intentional. My question today for you all is, do you think everyone should have the opportunity to travel to space? That is a very good question. <laughs> and the answer to it is yes. <laughs> Let me fill in the blank. So, so uh, I think everybody should have the opportunity to go into space, but currently, right now, it's not available for everybody to go. But we have now set the stage for anyone that wants to go into space to go into space. We now have private interests in what's happening in, in uh, low Earth orbit, particularly in the International Space Station, has opened up all sorts of possibilities. So all of you in this room, just, I'm just looking at your age group, you have been born in a um, world where we have been in space, where we lived in space where we've had people in space 24 seven. I grew up, and some of us here that are on the older <laughs> side grew up, that was not the case. So the possibilities are really endless. 
How many of you like to go to space? <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Awesome. Excellent. Do it. You can do okay. it. In space, you're away from family and in a new environment. How are you physically and emotionally affected? How do you deal with being homesick? I haven't even been back on Earth for a year yet, and that's just a sentence that starts with, I haven't been back on Earth. It's pretty cool. And the, the isolation is one piece. I live in this pressurized can, a big can in space, because right on the outside, it's you know, really hot or really cold, and there's no air, right? So um, the fact that you're isolated doesn't mean that you have to be disconnected. And so the connection to your family is something NASA takes very seriously. The video just doesn't do it justice. It is pretty amazing though. One of the most amazing things about his mission was that Stephanie organized a Zoom call for us, all of the black astronauts, to talk to Victor at least while he gave us the tour through the space station on an iPad. And he was in space at the same time that, you know, we were coming with the deliberation from George Floyd and we had all these things that we were thinking about down here on the planet with COVID and but having this connection with our brothers and family and people helped us all get through things. What um, boundaries did you have to overcome becoming an astronaut and what, did you ever struggle in school at any moment in time? I lost my hearing in a training accident. Um, I was completely deaf, and the doctors told me that I would never fly in space. And I was, my hearing started to slowly come back in my right ear, but only in the speaking frequencies. And they said, you know, you're medically disqualified, you won't fly. But I've always believed that if you keep trying, like the little engine that could, I think I can, I think I can. Your mind has a way, I'm not a neuroscientist, but a mind, your mind has a way of fixing your body, you know, if you believe in it enough. You know, you need doctors, you need other people, but you have a, a great stake in helping repair yourself by the way that you have your outlook. Bernard, I thought you know, it would be good uh, for you to talk about, you know, having a vision and thinking about where do you want to go in life. So when I did my spacewalk, I guess it was many years ago, um, it was the first time that an African American had, had done a spacewalk. It had been 30 years since the first time that uh, we had done a spacewalk. Dr. Harris, tomorrow you're to become the first African American to, to walk in space. How significant a first for that is you for, for you is that personally? Well, Brian, you know, uh, for me it really is a personal achievement, a great personal achievement, one that I've looked for for a long time. And I think it's kind of ironic that during this month, uh, this is Black History Month, that we're celebrating the contributions that African Americans have made to this country. But I have an opportunity to, to walk outside, walk outside in space, that is, an EBA. Uh, it really, I get emotional when I think about it. And I'd like to dedicate this spacewalk, my first spacewalk as an African American, and as, uh, as an African American, uh, to all African Americans, to African American achievement. And so, of course, I got the uh, commensurate call from the president, and that was President Clinton, and he said, uh, you know, Dr. Harris, congratulate, I want to congratulate you on you know, being the first African American to walk in space. And uh, I remember preparing, knowing that he was going to call. And I said, what the hell am I going to say to the president? Because <laughs> everybody's going to hear Mission Control and the rest of the world. And so I said these words that you've probably heard many times before. I said, Mr. President, thank you for the honor of your call. Uh, but I have to tell you that I may be the first, but I will not be the last. Amen. Yeah. And awesome. listening to <laughs> Bob Kirby now holding the record, that was true. So what can I say to you that, that will inspire you? And, and maybe uh, this statement, I believe that there are um, three things that I know about everybody in this room, three things. And if you adhere to these three things, you can accomplish whatever you want to do in life. And those things, three things uh, make it 
impossible for you to do anything. The first thing that I believe and believe in you is that I believe that everyone is born multipotential with the ability to do anything that they want to do in life, anything. You have to figure out what that is. You have to discover that very early as, as we all did. Number two, I believe that each and every one of you in this room is multi-talented, but we have something called a brain where we can learn additional talents. And that's what education is all about. So that's really important, right? And the last thing that I, that I believe that's really important for success in life, and that is, I believe that each and every one of us 